Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. We got zero music today because life is like a box of chocolates. Sometimes you get the orange cream. Uh, joining me this week. Okay, F excuse me. Orange cream is delicious. Uh, it's the worst. It's absolutely the worst. Um, it's the nightmare. Uh, it's the nightmare. Folks, we're here live uh, at 8 a.m., 8.01 a.m. Uh, for the execution of, uh, <laughs> I don't know, America. Uh, Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> for, for his crimes on January 6th. <laughs> crime, yeah. yeah, the first <laughs> to be called to the military tribunals of Joe Biden is Garfield. Yeah, he was, he served in Korea. I wasn't aware that Garfield <laughs> served in Korea. He, he's the reason they have Christianity. Um, yeah, Ian Gibson's not clear here. which side he was on, though. But. <laughs> Noted Garfield expert. Um here to answer the question if john in fact drank dog cum in the comic or not uh, we did. will get down he to did. it he did there, uh, there is no wiggle room we'll get we to that 4500 slide uh powerpoint <laughs> in just a little bit um, oh my god <laughs> that's my favorite thing of, about garfield oh uh, john loves <laughs> dog um you know, leftovers, uh, if, if you want Doggy to call batter. it that. Doggy batter. Doggy uh, batter. That's the second <laughs> time it's come up today <laughs> for the pancakes. Um, it's upcoming pancake stream. Get excited. Oh. Folks, we're here to talk about <clears throat> local chat, video games, all sorts of things. Episode 179. I'm so off without having that beautiful music that we downloaded off of a website once. Uh, and I just don't have it anymore. It's, it's, it's awful. But we shall continue into the ether as known as podcasting, Ian Gibson, I recently have begun model making again. Mm -hmm. uh, I bought a lot wow. of swimsuits, a full mirror, camera, posing, uh, and building... Uh, no, I've been building small little models with my hands like a little nerd. Um, uh -huh. And I've been kit bashing, which for those of you who don't know, uh, is you just take models and you kind of build whatever you want it's how they made all the star wars ships or any ship yep. and things in in movies before cgi um so i have started kit bashing you know it would have been helpful if i had brought the model over here but this is also an audio podcast so it doesn't really matter but anyways i um i have started i took the base uh saturn 5 rocket kit that i had from uh -huh. revel uh and what's um I want to say what scale, but what I really want to know is how how long is the rocket? Just give me a sense of size of parts. Um, so the, if I were to build the 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 actual Saturn V, it would probably be like two feet, maybe. Oh, okay, that's a nice little that's a nice it's little model. Like I this big. Like the the like lunar yeah. lander is like an inch across, and the command I, module gotcha. is like yeah an inch and a half. So. Um, so I started with that base, and then I, um, and basically I, I saw on, there was this tested video uh, of WonderCon, I think it is, where they do a bunch of model making, and this guy had built a, like, cargo ship, like a long cargo ship uh -huh. with, freight, with freight and everything, and I was like, oh, that'd be fun to build a cargo ship. So I have, I've built the front of it, which is mostly the Saturn V stuff, and then the middle section I have, uh, is just two film canisters glued together with uh yeah, that works currently with one of the spare wheels from the death stranding trike in the middle of that for like a ring yeah. effect and then i'm gonna put um a bunch of i found a good uh 3d printable um cargo containers and i'm gonna put those yeah. on there to have some like cargo containers and paint them different colors uh, and, and I have a bunch of decals and water slides left over from uh, the yep. Death Stranding that say like that look like caution tape and stuff like that. So I'm going to put all those on there. And then the back half of it that connects to that, um, I have like an idea of what I'm going to do, but I haven't quite executed on it yet. But it's been uh, it's been super fun to build a model without having to refer back to something because you kind of just place things willy nilly. Uh, yep. And it feels really good. Uh, also, I bought styrene, which I know is your favorite thing, which is I bought the thin styrene sheets. I bought like an odds and ends pack and then yeah. uh, a bunch of tubes and stuff. So those have been fun right now on the front half of the ship. I'm on the greebly stage. So I'm just like adding a bunch of shit to it, 
from like Gundam kits, from all sorts of s stuff I have, uh, and I've been cutting out panels to like add to the front uh, to make it look like uh, like cutouts and stuff like that. The big thing yeah. that I'm I wouldn't say struggling with is I know with model making and, and greeblies and stuff you want to like balance layers and like negative space and positive space. The only problem I keep being too afraid to like cut into the model. Um, so I, I have to like, I figure out a good way to get a little bit more negative space out of it. But I think since I'm only focusing on the front half, there's that middle section I was talking about, which is very skinny. So I think that'll help balance the like finished yeah. model out. I just haven't glued it all together yet. Um, you also, you could fun. also do girders. Since you have the styrene, you could use some of the rods so that instead of having like the middle and the front directly connected, just make a bunch of fake girders, even if it's just like a centimeter or two and yeah. attach them that way. I did actually, I found someone's, because originally I had a different plan for the center and I found someone's International Space Station and I uh, cut out from it a bunch of trusses. So I have like mm. these 3D printed trusses I made that I might attach to it somewhere, yeah. but but so far it's coming out pretty good uh, the the it's fun working with that that thin super thin glue that just like melts the plastic together um i had a couple that's, issues with like yeah the um the film canisters didn't like that glue because they're polyurethane i think so i actually yeah, i've had that problem too i ended up buying jb weld that came uh but i yep. i ended up super gluing or not super gluing hot gluing them together and putting like uh thing so i hot glued the two open ends together and i put uh beams on the inside like strips of plastic and i ended up putting glue on those quickly and shoving the whole thing together so it's actually holding really a lot better than i thought it would um that's good so yeah because initially with i was trying different clues and then i finally googled it and they're like yeah you're gonna have to get like jb weld or something and i'm like oh okay yeah like hit the super yeah. heavy duty stuff um, yeah, I feel like I should get back to kit bashing because I I had one where I had I had probably it's it's a ten inch. I can't remember if it is a carrier or a a, a destroyer, but basically it was a small little crappy plastic boat model that I got off somebody for ten bucks. So it's like a like a modern naval ship, and I took the whole of it and I put a giant pill bottle on the back of it, and I was like, I'm gonna do kind of like a space battleship Yamato where it's like. It's a spaceship, but it looks like a naval warship with a giant engine on the back of it. And I started mocking that out, but then I had problems with gluing it. And then um, I realized I was going to have to like patch a bunch of it. Because mm -hmm. to me, uh, I've, I've been I've used Tamiya putty. Tamiya putty is great. Like it just comes out as a paste, and you put it where you want. It dries pretty quickly, and then you sand it flat. It's just kind of annoying because you have to like do multiple layers, and you got to be precise about it. I feel like I should get back to that. the The problem I'm curious if if you will solve this problem that I had with kit bashing, which was with the styrene, the problem I started having was getting like very consistent, clean line cuts mm -hmm. and 90 degree cuts because you can't really freehand those. And so I ended up buying like a lot of like little tiny squares and like like a cheap sliding paper cutter because I could I could score the styrene with that. And um, it was especially difficult when I wanted to have duplicates of parts like like, oh, I made this weird little triangle panel on the left side. And I'm like, oh, shoot. Now I have to like trace that and duplicate that cut on the right hand side. That was kind of the, the one obstacle that I never really found a good solution to was like making like clean, consistent duplicate parts with with clean, straight lines. Not that I want the ship to just be that, but sometimes you just yeah. want a panel. It's just a box, you know. Yeah, I'm I'm terrible at cutting straight lines in anything. I like I feel like I always for some reason like if I'm guiding it with a ruler, the like the exacto knife like curves away from it sometimes yeah. and you're like whoops or like you move the ruler by accident. So I like I I'll like measure it a couple times, do it with a pencil and like really lock it down before I go to cut it. But yeah. like you said with those little parts, like you just want consistency. And I was thinking of, I've been Googling a lot of like, oh, how to properly cut circles out of styrene and stuff like that. And it's a lot of people would like, uh, buy, like, not I you have tool. to buy I something, have but they're like, get a chop, like those choppers from Micromark yeah. or get a stencil or something that can cut circles because you're going to save yourself yeah. so much time 
by purchasing that than you would f trying to do it by hand. And I'm like, oh, that's exactly, a good point. Yeah. I, I cut out some panels, so at the front of the ship, um, I the the Saturn V had these, like, the part that, like, breaks away the command module yeah. comes out of, and so I took those and I I um, added a bunch of greedies to them and, and uh, uh, stuff. So they're going to be on the front of the ship, like, flowering out, like, petals. And um, those pieces, I cut out uh, panels to go on that to give it a little bit more flavor. And those, each one of those is a little bit off, but since they're, like, in a ring near each other, you can't really tell looking at it. It'd be like if you yeah. walked up and, and triple check. So I was like, okay, I'm, I'm fine with this. I, I messed up a couple things on it where I was trying to glue some, like, little gears from other models and it wasn't looking good so i was like i need to cover this up with something so i i threw that on there um i did in fact so i meant to mention revel kits you and i know are like the bargain basement of of most kit kits uh model kits they they always have a ton of yeah. flashing they're like really not well, so the only thing i would say is i the only slight correction I would have to that is I don't want to give the impression that Revel is crap and everything else is okay. It's more no, like no, no, seventy five percent no. of the market is crap, and Revel is in that section. Yes, you know for I mean? sure. And, and and Revel has exceptions. Like I bought um for this because I was like, what are cheap models to buy? And they're like, get tanks because they have like fifty thousand pieces for things. Yeah. And I I kind of regret the two models I bought only because they're they were on the cheaper end, so they don't have a ton of parts because they're on the cheaper end. Um, but for like they were like around fifteen bucks each. I want to say is uh, a tank. I have no idea what it's a World War Two tank, uh, and then a uh, uh, a U.S. Chinook uh, helicopter. Oh, Chinook and so I got those. And honestly, the tank stuff is a little shitty. The Chinook model, I need to ch double check the box because it came in a different type of box fantastic like super well yeah. built out and pressed and everything and i was like i honestly almost want to just are build you, this uh are you aware of the website scale mates scale mates maybe i might have been to it so it's basically a database for plastic model kits and what it does really really well is that you can go look up a kit and it will tell you okay this kit got a new box art in 2022 but it's using the same plastic molding oh. from 1970 and then it will and then it will it has people add pictures of here's the, what the sprues look like here's the instruction manual here's a picture of it built here's reviews so it's literally just like a database for plastic models so it's a great way to look up a kit and be like oh yeah they updated the box art but it's using 50 year old plastic and it looks like shit versus oh this one is something they refreshed 2 years ago and the sprues look brand new and they look like they actually clean them up, et cetera. Gotcha. So it's a great way of, for those questionable models, like if it's Tamiya, if it's Hasegawa, if it's Bandai, you're good. They're great models. But if anything else, I'm like, let me go to Scalemates and see if it's actually a good kit or not. Because gotcha. like, I just finished my my BF109, um, which was like a $10 crap kit, but I was like, it's 10 bucks and I, and I want to practice. So I was like, let me throw this together. And of course it takes me like nine months because I'm slow at it. But I, I posted pictures in the Discord, basically... The front of the plane is kind of a clamshell. So everything from the front of the cockpit all the way up to like the propeller cap is a clamshell. And the way the clamshell came together, you built the whole engine and then you put the clamshell around the engine. And the way it came together, I still don't know if it was my fault or the model kits, but basically there was like a four millimeter gap, which is like almost almost like a quarter inch gap between the two panels at the top <laughs> and so like they just didn't come together and but thankfully i had styrene and i and i it took me like a week but i took styrene and i made a strip that was the exact size and i put it in between the two clamshells and i did putty sand putty sand putty sand and you can't even tell there was a gap now but it was one of those things where i, where I put them together and i'm like this is so fucked i'm tempted to just give up on this model like halfway through but th I mean, thankfully, I was able to fix it, but it's because those kits are so shit that they don't give you reference points. Like like the way I describe it is if you have a piece and you have a flat panel and the piece needs to attach to the flat panel. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's a Tamiya kit, 
if it's a Bandai kit, they will have a hole in the flat panel. They will have a divot, right? And it will be a key to divot. So it will be like a triangle or something. So that way there's only one way to put the part in. You know exactly where it goes because it fits in the fucking slot, right? If it's a Revel kit, there is no hole. <laughs> there is no key to indentation. It is just a panel and then a picture being like, put it here, right? And, and when you do that and then you keep attaching stuff on that same method, if you made a mistake somewhere, if it didn't go right, if it's slightly off, then the whole thing is off by like 10 degrees. It's not coming together. It's not aligned right. So it's just, it, per your example, bad kits have flashing that you have to clean up. And they're also a pain to put together because they are not providing you with like very specific, you know, uh, indentations or uh, keyholes, et cetera, to know that you're putting it in the exact right orientation in place. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the, there's some, I've just found a spot to put these like uh fuel tanks from the uh saturn 5 kit and i was putting the fuel tanks together gluing the two sides together and i just like paused and looked at them like are these meant to go together because they were so off when yes. perfectly glued and i was like i guess so i just sat there sanding the edges on them like I yeah you're like i glued together. them together but <laughs> yeah but now i have to sand and patch after the fucking glue and it's just a pain in the ass yeah and, and it's it's wild how much that styrene adds because i had like a seam on the front of the ship by where the like front is and i was like oh let me put a styrene strip around that make it look better and yeah. i put that around there and it wasn't perfectly put on there like you can if you really look at it you can see it, it kind of goes up and down a little bit at certain points but it looks leaps and bounds better than it did like it just adds that depth to it so yeah i'm really excited for That's that awesome. i i opened up uh, one plain model I had out back and then the other one I, I left closed because I was like, I might want to build a Messer Schmidt at some point. That'd be fun. Um, and then uh, I have I have a bunch of Tamiya kits. I'm like, I'm not touching these. These are actual good kits. I like I have that yeah. uh, Tamiya put out uh, waterline battleship models recently, like within the last couple of years. Oh. And I bought the, or I got it for my birthday, the New Jersey uh, battleship but they do like a bunch of stuff I actually if you're ever on YouTube uh, I don't know if you if you visit YouTube very often but if you're ever over there um, check out uh, there's I don't know who it is but you can find it by just searching for it uh, it's nude women no uh, they're like model shows in Japan and people just uh -huh. go to them and film they're them going oh, to the conventions great. and like oh here's the Tamiya brought one of their uh pressing machines to make uh uh whatever molds Bruce. like uh, to make sprues yeah. like here come come over here inject all the plastic and everything you make one, a one sprue model that you get to take home and then like oh, oh here's so the 2024 cool. items and they're like looking at everything and like putting up pictures and stuff and that's how i found out about those models and i'm like oh to go to japan and like go to one of these would be so yeah. much fun um, because they're in America, those types of conventions are very sad, but in Japan, they're very exciting <laughs> and cool uh, because yeah. people are into it. So, uh, yeah, it's really nice. And going into a model without worrying about painting it properly is really cool. Like I still, I still get that nagging where I'm like, oh, like what if I want this part to be a different color? And I'm just like, I don't care. I'm I'm gonna finish this model. I'm gonna put it all together. I'm gonna paint it base white and then i'm gonna mask off all the sections and do it that way i'm not gonna worry about pre-painting pieces and adding them yeah um i also picked up a great trick from a recent uh it was just a recommended tested video and i was like i haven't watched tested in a while and it was uh fawn davis who is a model maker who used to work for or for ilm and adam, uh, work with adam savage and stuff and he was saying if you want to do like paint peeling like messing up uh, and coming off, uh, you take rock salt and you uh, crush it up, yeah. and then dab it I've and put that. water. Yeah, uh, and it he was showing really that well, off, yeah. and I was like, "Oh, that is such a good idea!" Like, I don't know why I didn't like people. So I think of that. I use that as well, but I also uh, I have a second use of it, which is I put a little bit of glue in it, and I don't take it off. So I've got I've got a model that was like it's like a little german uh armored car from world war ii yes and i remember this i 
I caked, it's basically a bunch of caked on mud on the tires and the bottom half of it using that technique, using, using the salt and, and some glue and, and, and then you mix paint in it as well. So it turns it to a color. Mm-hmm. Hi, uh, Lord of Bread. How's it going? Oh, sorry. Sound, sound alerts aren't on for local chat. I apologize. But yeah. someday we'll sing Money by RuPaul. I don't even know what that clip is. <laughs> um, money, 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 money. Money, money, uh, money. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. great. Um, it's, it, I, I, you're feeling the exact same I'm feel, way I was feeling when I was like, let me try this. And immediately I was like, oh, there's so much freedom. I can put this here and that there. And it's nothing against model kits. It's just surprising to me how different it feels when you're kit bashing versus following a model guide. Uh, they both have their positives and negatives, but kit bashing was like this. It felt like I was turning on a huge spigot of creativity when, yeah. when I when I started I, doing that. I keep getting like, oh, like I, I'll allow myself. I'm saving this piece for a specific spot and stuff like that. But I keep being like, yeah. oh, I don't want to just put that there. I'm not sure if the, and I, I have to like throw that away. Be like, no, just sh- put shit on it. Like, who cares? This is not pre-planned. Yeah. Um, like any ideas you have, you don't have to use now. You can use later. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to paint it. I think I'm going to order a couple more, uh, to me, a spray cans. I think I'm going to do this like a mustardy yellow and then like the base ship and then dirty it up and maybe like strips of like, I don't know. I kind of want it to look like a freighter from like, I want to, what's that terrible movie? It's not silent running. Star Wars. Um, it's the one with the guy who sings with all the robots. It's a terrible movie, but I want it to look like that one. Oh, I don't know. Um, it's very bad. It's not Silent Running because that's a submarine movie. It's something like that. Oh, it's it's bad. Um, I turned it off. Uh, but anyways, that's kit bashing. Uh, another f- is this another form of kit bashing? This NERF? I've never heard of it. Is that the that's uh, the place from Evangelion? Nerve. Yes. Yes, that's right. <laughs> you have child soldiers. Uh, no, so I, I, I've, I have recently dove back into 3D printing because I, I've had a 3D printer for, I think I did the calculation. I think it's like seven years. And um, long story short, I replaced my old temperamental printer with a bamboo P1S, which is incredible. Guys, it's, it's the Todd Howard of printers. It just works, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's insane. Like, the only times I've had problems are personal mistake and there's like i tried to print petg and it it's okay but apparently their default profile is not good so you have to pick a different profile that's it and and i've i'm like i'm like designing stuff and 3d printing stuff and really enjoying it and part of it is i want to get better at i've got some blind spots with my 3d design which is gears and mechanical linkages and things like that so i'm I'm like, okay, I want to learn more about that stuff and I want to get some more ideas for designs and things. And I've I've slowly realized that for me, there's kind of two things that help. One is like watching YouTube videos of people being like, here's how to do reference pins. Here's how to do planetary gears and stuff. And then the other thing that really helps is seeing and printing other people's kits and having it in my hand and playing around with it and being like, oh, this connects to here. And oh, you've got a ratchet here and you've got slight tolerance. Oh, here's how you have it. So you can, you know, connect it to each other, et cetera. And that all leads to, Will, are you familiar with how fucking bonkers the nerf scene has gotten lately? Um, I, I'm, I feel like I'm aware as in the same way I'm aware of how bonkers politics have gotten lately. <laughs> Like, I, I okay. just hear about it. Like, you're you know? aware it's bonkers. Yeah. 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 Cause I, I, I get served stuff on, on TikTok. Like, I knew it was a little weird because I remember back in like 2016, 2017, probably when I first started looking at 3D printers, um, printing your own Nerf blasters was, was, was starting to be a big thing enough where there was, there was one guy I followed and he had started a business. He's like, I designed Caliburn. Like, it's a really good, accurate, like, like, uh, spring manual action, uh, nerf rifle and it uses nerf standard nerf magazines and he would he like designed it and he 3d printed it and he would sell it and i kind of stopped following him and coming back like he's a big guy now and there's like a whole bunch of other people who basically design custom nerf blasters and there's like a big nerf community now of like adults who play nerf like they would with airsoft or paintball or whatever so they have little tournaments they have little get-togethers but the other thing is that the technology has become crazy. Like the like they basically lean into like dual brushless motors 
so that if you really wanted to, you could buy something that is the size of a handgun. It has a hundred round magazine and it shoots nerf darts at like 500 rounds per minute. <laughs> like it's just Jeez. like it just spits it out. Right. And then and it's fairly accurate. And, and so basically it's this weird thing where like there are still nerf guns. Nerf is pretty popular. There's a bunch of non nerf companies that have popped up. But it, at least in my view, it feels like half the market and a majority of the adult nerf market are all these third party companies that are selling custom designs, they're selling custom desarts, darts, et cetera. So anyways, where this ties back into 3D printing is a lot of those are 3D printable designs where somebody has designed it and they're like, look, you can 3D print these parts and then you just need to buy this hardware, this this bar, this screw, et cetera. And then there's companies that are like, hey, you, we can give you three options, right? You can pay us and we we send you the fully assembled 3D printed gun. You pay us, we send you just the hardware kit where we've sourced all the parts and put them in a bag for you and and the 3D printed parts that we printed for you. Or you could buy just the hardware. And I was like, fuck yeah, let me buy just the hardware. So basically for like, I think the hardware, the bag of hardware was like 40 bucks, which was pretty, it sounds like a lot, but it's pretty good because once I look at it, I'm like, they've got like elastic paracord. They got like a hundred screws. They got like five different size cotter pins. They got all this stuff that I'm like, if I had to manually do this myself, I would be lucky to hit $40, and if I hit $40, I would have a shitload of all these other extra parts because I'd have to buy a bunch of different kits. Yeah. Um, so it's so you buy that, you download the STLs, you 3D print all the files. It took me about two, two and a half days, and it ended up being like a kilogram of plastic. And at the end of it, I have, I've got this guy, which is, it's a lever action... Uh, it's a lever action nerf rifle, which is really crazy. And it's insane putting it together because there's a powerful spring in here. And uh, it's got a magazine and everything like this. This is an example of this is plastic injection molded and it was seven dollars <laughs> and it's a 15 <laughs> round plastic magazine with half darts. So that's the thing is like the community is all like we want half darts. They're better. So they're just darts cut in half, basically. And I bought I think it was ten dollars for a box of 200 darts. And then seven dollars for the magazine. Everything else is 3D printed. It was pretty fun putting it together because I'm learning a lot of the different like mechanics of it and the springs and everything. But it's scary. And I'll tell you why it's scary. This thing shoots 200 FPS like like it's super oh loud. <laughs> it's one of those things where like I was like, oh, I'll get a Nerf gun. And I'll shoot Maggie with it. Maggie will shoot with me with it. And then I was like, I shot it for the first time and I was like. I can't shoot people with this. <laughs> like, I've it's killed, too mean. I've killed someone. It's too mean. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's 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 one of those things where I was like, it's a weird little project. I'm not going to use it for nerfing like I like I really should. But it's really cool, kind of like kit bashing to like see what other people are doing in the community and put your hands in that and be like, this is cool. So I I've started. It's also a really cool platform for. One of the things I struggle with with 3D design is like, I'm like, I want to 3D design something, but I'm like, what do I design, right? And I'm yeah. like, oh, I should make a little pen holder for the fridge. I should make a little thing over here. I make a little shelf over here. But this gives me another platform. Like already, I'm like, I think the stock is too short. So I'm going to use the current parts as a reference to design a new longer stock. And then I was looking at, it has iron sights on it and I don't really like them. So I started designing like I this was my first test print. I was like, I'm going to design like a bigger ring site for it. So it's like a really nice platform, kind of like kit bashing, where I'm like, I have something really cool that somebody else did. And I and I built it off their design. But now I'm going to start designing all sorts of stuff on top of it. And it's just it's really, really cool. Uh, if you I know you got a 3D printer, if you were thinking about getting into the a 3D printed Nerf gun, it's it's pretty cool. It's yeah, cool. I I was I was thinking about that because I think I would set up my other my my ender to do that only because the the stuff on the on the on the resin is a little too brittle I would say to do something like yeah. that I, I I've been printing that uh, my resin 3D or my resin 3D my resin uh, Blade Runner gun and that's coming together pretty well i've i was actually doing test fits and i snapped a piece and i was like yeah this is a little brittle like i wouldn't like my 3d printed uh fdm blade runner gun i could see myself dropping and it being okay the resin one i, I can't yeah. see dropping that and it being okay um yeah the other problem with that the hiccup is I, i'm slowly printing it but i have to sand a lot of those pieces and that is a mask on 
Ugh. ventilated area, uh, wet sand, because you don't want dust. Um, and yeah. I don't even feel comfortable sanding that outside because that's putting it outside. Uh, it is cured resin, so it's it's not bad for the environment. Uh, in any uh, in any way other than littering, I guess. Uh, but mm -hmm. I um so that's like the stopgap there. My other thought was um. I don't think I'm gonna do it here at this apartment, but I eventually that model I think I would take apart and just use all those resin pieces to cast better like a th harder resin pieces to put like sand those all yeah. down make molds cast harder thicker resin and put that all together yeah. i did buy um this guy in england who also made the snub-nosed version of the gun which i'm excited to put together um he sells little hardware kits for that as well and i was like oh i i have the hardware for those guns settled but he sent he put together the little electronics kit as well and uh, with like guides on how to put it all together and i was like oh this is perfect for when for when this gun's ready to go but that's kind of yeah. why i moved over to the kit bashing because i was like i need something i can put together right now and work on yeah and like not be in this yeah. waiting for 3d printers doldrums that i was sitting yeah. in so uh, it wasn't i was bad. i was i was a little worried putting this together because when i started looking at it and they were like you're gonna put this spring in it and it's lever action and it's all 3d printed i was like I know 3D printed PLA like is this really going to be strong enough? But um, they, they they gave really good print settings. They were like, look, everything is five walls and 20 percent infill minimum. And then for certain parts, like there's certain parts that are under spring spring tension, et cetera. They were like 100 percent infill. And and when I put those together and I pulled them off the build plate, I'm like, OK, yeah, this is a solid fucking chunk of plastic at this point. Like it still technically has layer lines, but the adhesion is so good and it's 100 percent infill that I was like, OK, this this works well. So, yeah, I think it, it's PLA is perfectly fine with it. I, I wouldn't do resin unless you're doing like the super expensive, tough resin, at which yeah. point it's like, don't do the resin. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, there's a lot of things that I I want to build now. And I'm like, I think the like resin print into mold into something else is probably the way to do them but for now um it, it's coming out pretty good but uh i keep i keep redo i actually learned a new support technique which is instead of like heavy supports just do a billion light supports with one or two heavies yeah. and then after i wash everything in isopropyl before i cure put it in really warm water for like five minutes and then you pull it out and it just like peels off um because i was getting nice. a lot of pitting uh beforehand and then Where those uh, supports were connecting yeah. yeah exactly and it was looking not great um and also if you don't have enough supports in it starts warping uh and then these are like mechanical parts and i can't have them warping because they won't fit together anymore uh so yeah, yeah that was a lot of stuff um anyways sorry that was a chit chat section took 30 minutes but you know what there i oh, wow. i personally haven't been playing many video games this week as we descend into the video game section um the only one uh actually there's two there's one i forgot to put on here uh there's elden ring i've been playing teensy bit barely played this week i i had a good amount of work this week so i i didn't really get a chance to play it uh but i am at the academy of uh Rhea lucara whatever it is i fought the dog with the sword in the debate hall and now i'm i'm moving on to ranala i did a bunch of there's a great uh there's a great farming spot for souls where it's like a bunch of enemies worth two thousand souls each or not souls runes sorry uh and uh they just kind of sit there and don't do anything so you get like forty thousand runes every time you go through the area it's not that easy there's guards there that are tough and you actually have to fight uh but i was just leveling up a bunch and now i have to go fight renala who is sad about her husband leaving her uh and i i tried it once and i got to the second stage pretty quick so i was like i think i can do this by myself without calling someone in to just like get through mm -hmm. it for me I, I theoretically can go do the DLC now. Uh, I have to fight Moog. Uh, I'm just... I can't remember what level he is, so I need to, like, double-check that I'm actually able to fight him uh, and, and go get into the DLC. But uh, it's fun. I think, still, still Elden Ring. I think where you are is, like, exactly where I stopped playing Elden Ring. I think I stopped at the ball at the Academy. So it's after the dogfight. 
and then there's the ball. You go like on the roofs, and then there's a ball rolling down a ramp. Oh yeah, that ball's easy. That's that's where I stopped. But yeah. it was it was in the ball that it was just dying to the ball once. I was like, yeah, okay, I think I'm done with this game. I was like, yep, and it and it wasn't it wasn't the ball. It was just that was the straw that I was like. Yeah, I've had my fill of this game. That you know, at the top of those stairs, there's a really hard phantom uh, up there. So it, 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 no, I did fight that guy. I did. So it must have been that guy. I fought that yeah, guy. That guy sucks. That was it? It's funny. I think I, I beat him, and that was it. I beat him so easily the first time I played this game, and I'm a different build now, and I'm like, uh, like I don't know what to do. Yeah. Like help, and then finally killed him. I was like, oh okay. Um, yeah, we talked about this last time, but playing this my second run, it's great to just look up builds and be like, how do I annihilate people? Like, yeah, tell me how, how to do this. And they're like, oh, here it is. Yeah. And I'm like, I like, I don't care about cheeses and stuff because I have legitimately killed these bosses before. Like, just get me through it. Uh, it's great. Uh, and then the other game I've been playing is Last Call BBS, which is Zaktronic's final game. We've talked about it here before. It is a fake computer interface with a bunch of games on it. Uh, those games are all difficult and crazy. Uh, a lot of them yeah, are. Yeah. Uh, the Gundam... I, I was going to say, I want to love that game. And I think this is the problem with all of Zachtronics games is that his base difficulty is too difficult. He just needs to tone things down a bit on normal difficulty, and then his games would be incredible. But yeah. it feels like he just ramps up the difficulty too quickly. It's, it's like, well, I just don't have an understanding of programming video games that well. And I'm just like, yeah. Like, I looked up a guide because I was playing 20th Century Food Court, which is this, like, uh, Factorio-type game that you're building stuff out, but you yep. you also have, like, a code module thing. And so I put the first one together, and I was like, oh, this is cool. And then I was like, the, I got to the second level, and I'm like, I can't do this. So I actually looked up <laughs> easiest, easiest Zaktronics games to get into, and they said the um, Opus Magnum and Exapunks are the two easiest to get into so i might uh, those are sitting in my cart i might buy one of them i'm leaning towards exapunks uh which is the like robot yeah, i've heard one. good things about that yeah. um but i will say in last call bbs the gundam builder is really fun and cool and, and and silly uh but the i should say fake gundam builder but the um the dungeons it's a dungeons game it's it's picross but uh, yeah. you're, you're making past the treasure and stuff. I've been tearing through that game. It is that one's so good. much fun. It is just hard enough. I'll play it for like an hour and then leave and then come back and boot it up. And I'll like, that's the type of game where you just need time away and you get back in. And you're like, oh, finish this level in five seconds. Uh, and you're like, because you your brain was working on it while you were doing other stuff. Uh, it's very fun. I wish it wasn't in Last Call BBS so I could just pop it up whenever i wanted to yeah uh but uh yeah that, that game is really cute I, i'm sad i'm not sad but there's a lot of it i can't there's messages i'm missing because i think i have to like beat some of those other games and everything and i'm just like i don't have time for this but zaktronics is great I, it's sad they don't make games anymore but i think that guy was successful and is happy doing what he's doing so um yeah yeah uh that's that's the games i've been playing ian gibson are the games you've been playing yeah, uh, I've been playing Fallout New Vegas. I won't talk about it much because I'm streaming it. So uh, come check it out 5 p.m. Eastern this afternoon. We've got uh, episode four. Uh, we've just got through. Ro Robo Robo Repcon Repcon factory. Um, so we'll be just to give you an idea of where we are. Novak Repcon region, etc. Uh, I have been playing a new game called The First Descendant. Will, what do you know about The First Descendant? Do you remember this from? It was definitely um, an E3. Do you remember this from Game Awards as well? I don't. I So I saw you write this on here, and I said, oh, a new Game Pass game, because there's no way Ian has paid for a video game. And then I checked Game Pass, and it wasn't there. And I was like, oh, that's weird. I, I should say, there's no game that you would suddenly purchase that I probably haven't heard of. Uh, that's Oh, that's fair. That's valid. Um, And I was like, oh, that's weird. And then I clicked, I saw it was trending on Twitter. I'm like, that's weird. So I click on the Twitter trending and it's like, someone was like, this is the best free game ever. And I was like, oh, okay, so it's free. And then I saw the screenshots of this video game. And boys, if you love jerking off to video games, I'm excited for I you. Don't, uh, I don't, I don't, I 
no, you do like jerking off to video games. There's one character. There's one character in this game, and they are kind of a main character called Bunny. And yes, they look like that. But you don't play as them until maybe five or six hours into the game, and you only see them as a quest giver. I, I will just so, say, I will say, I'm just thanks. saying, I'm just saying this because I'm, because I don't think you're I don't think you're allowed to say that in a year when Stellar Blade came out, which was literally just let's let's take this hot real life Korean uh, influencer and build an entire video game around staring at her basically yeah, nude but, the entire game. This is not that. But Ian, this is not that. Ian, Sweet Baby Ink got to Stellar Blade. It did not get to uh <laughs> according to twitter this is what we get when <laughs> sweet baby ink isn't involved uh God, and it was just so a tough. lot of shots of her crotch from below and i was like yeah guys let me tell it's... you about the porn industry <laughs> yeah yeah no i get you but I, I i i'm just as much as i would love to go down that path with you and say oh yeah it's got tits i don't that's not really what this game is i think no, it's just i, I think it's just I leaning agree. into like what would you call that you, I would call that I would call that future future east asian adult where it's like it's not trying to do an anime it's not trying to do a chibi it's trying to do like a future aesthetic with some with some east asian vibes in it and it and it does have some sexy characters but they're not like in bikinis they're not scantily clad it's just like form fitting yeah it's like anime There's, cyberpunk because when I yeah. think of Asian future, like cyberpunk, I think of Blade Runner, which yeah, isn't it's exactly like that. that. Yeah, it's more of like a, a, a yeah, anime. That's like, chibi. that's like, that's like, that's like Western. Like, I, I, I'm not saying it right, but that's like, oh, like cyberpunk is like Western made. Asia will be more popular in the future. This is like Asian made. Asia will be more popular. Yeah, I can see that. Um, yeah. But anyways, yeah. uh gameplay for this yeah so i i hopped into this because um you know this showed off at e3 and some other showcases and it looks really good and it's just a looter shooter like the i think the easiest way to describe it is that it is a mix between destiny and warframe um destiny because you have guns you're running through some open areas and they have uh enemies in those open areas but it's really more about like hey go over here and uh pop start this mission and shoot these guys and then you'll get some loot from it and then there's a there's a hub world um which is just an area where you go back and it's it's really just like the tower in destiny 2 where there's npc standing around it's like hey this guy will sell you guns this guy will research new weapons this guy lets you break them down this guy's a quest giver this guy's a level up etc um and and then it's like Warframe because I haven't played a lot of Warframe, but my understanding in Warframe is that you have a frame, which is like your your body or your suit. Mm -hmm. So you switch between you switch between those frames to change your ability set and your ability set is like, you know, throw a grenade, throw an electric charge, run faster, do a ground pound, pop your ultimate ability and stuff. So you have like four or five basic abilities and a passive. And so you're you're like working towards unlocking these new um, in, de in descendant and first descendant. They're called descendants, but it's really just like you're unlocking a new. It's so stupid because they're, it's the same thing Warframe does where they're like, we're skinning it as like you're putting on a new suit and descendant. They're like, you're unlocking a new descendant. And it's like, no, you're just changing character. You're just changing your character's ability set. That's all it is, right? You're changing the mo you're changing you're switching to a different character. Your weapons carry over, your level carries over, your skills carry over. Uh well in descendant, they don't necessarily. You actually kind of start differently. But like like I I was at level 11 and I just unlocked a bunny as a as a descendant and it was like boom, here's bunny, it starts at level 10. You can your weapons carry over, but it's different abilities and different level ups. Mm -hmm. Um so you really just like instead it it's it's actually a nice thing where it's like you're 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 playing a different character, but it's not the MMO tradition of when you log in, you pick a new character and it's completely separate items, et cetera. It's like just makes it easy to kind of switch your play style around. Is it um, kind of like um, in Final Fantasy 14? Like you're the yes, same character, similar. you can just change classes. Yeah, you change your job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Um so yeah it's and it's it's pretty good i'm actually kind of enjoying it like it definitely has it's not amazing but i've i've been itching to play destiny but the problem is i've played enough destiny 2 to know that like 
I know what fucking Destiny 2 is, right? Like, I'm like, I'm gonna play more Destiny. Oh, I guess I go back to that Earth map and I do fucking global. I guess I do strikes, but I've already done most of them. And it's like, well, this is this feels the the gameplay mechanics and structure is very similar to Destiny. It's just it's just different, you know, so like I'm enjoying it. Uh, the gunplay is third person. It's not quite as good as Destiny feels, but it still feels pretty good. Um, I'm still getting used to the abilities. Uh, it leans a lot into elemental damage and stuff. Mm -hmm. So like I was playing a guy who throws grenades and he kind of starts out with like, hey, you throw grenades and it does like a little bit of fire damage. And then I was like picking up buffs and they're like, hey, put this on your gun and it'll add fire damage to each bullet. And then I was putting buffs on myself that were like, hey, you do plus 15 percent fire damage across the board, etc. But then there's also like electrical and there's like ice damage, etc. So you're starting to like. I'm starting to see how you can make builds um, and the missions are, are super quick. They do something really, really well that I don't think Destiny did this from what I remember. But basically, you know, you have those those like open world zones where there's other people. So there's other there's other players there as well. And it feels like when I, when I go to one of those zones, they are instancing me in there with people who are similar level. And what happens is if if any one of us starts a mission and somebody else in that zone is also on that same mission, it immediately, boom, you're partied Ooh. up with this person for this mission. You're exactly where they are. And it's really cool because like I, I've probably done 30 missions now. And I want to say there's only two missions that I did completely solo because you would, you would go up to a little beacon and you'd be like, boop, start mission. And it would just be like, boom, you're in this party. And most of the time they're nearby in the fight so you just walk over and join them and there was maybe two or three times where they were like they were like two three minutes into the mission they were somewhere else and it was just like boom you're in the party and it immediately teleported me drop drop me where they were caught up with their progress i'm going along with them and it's fantastic because the game's solo the game's okay playing as solo it's kind of like destiny like destiny's not that fun playing solo yeah. but when you have like when you have like spongier enemies and you've got multiple people and you're like, OK, I don't have to deal with all these enemies. I can switch to I can lean back and switch to a sniper and they'll deal with the close ups, etc. It becomes a lot more fun. And I've done a couple strikes. They have like uh, the Colossi, which are like big enemy boss fights. I've only done one or two of those, Ooh. but it's it's one of those things where it just feels like a solid. It's a really, really solid seven out of ten. It's a very good Destiny Warframe clone and it's free. So honestly, I would recommend playing it. You should check it out. We could play it. It's I, I, I will hop in. I'll play it for 30 minutes. I'll do like two, three missions, gain a level. And then I'll be like, OK, let me go do something else for a while. And then I'll pop in. And, and I just started playing it like yesterday or the day before. And I've already played like you know, four hours of it or something. So I highly recommend it. if you're into Destiny or Warframe, check out First Descendant. I feel like it's got it's not perfect, but it's got a lot going on there that will satisfy that itch for you. Nice. What do <clears throat> what are you playing it on? I might have missed that. I'm playing it on PC, but it it's got it's got crossplay. I know that because some of the people that I'm randomly dropping into missions with, they've got an Xbox logo or a PlayStation logo on them. So I don't. Nope. I'm assuming it has cross save or and cross save and cloud save, etc. I don't know that for sure, but I'm playing on PC and I'm I'm playing with other people on consoles, etc. Perfect. Yeah, I'll check it out. Um. That sounds like fun. I will say one thing, though, they do an immediate story dump on you. And I tried to stick with that. They're, they're trying to serve you a story. And I tried to stick with that story cutscenes. And after maybe 10, 15 minutes worth of story, not continuously, but over the course of several missions, I was like, I don't need these stories anymore. So I, I have just started dumping the cutscenes, just skipping <laughs> all the cutscenes. And it makes it much Plus, better because it's not terrible. It's just it's not well presented. And they're trying to have you build up relationships with these characters and i'm like i'm not here for this i'm just give me a looter shooter i don't need this much character dialogue gotcha uh oh i will mention i did see end credits on paper mario uh and oh. that is because karen beat paper mario and thousand year door uh and i'm not mm. allowed to talk about it she said uh mm -hmm. she's gonna save it for the next time she's on local chat little does she okay. know she's never invited but no uh so oh. Eventually, when Karen's back on the show, she'll talk about Thousand Year Door and her experience with that. But I was, I did say to her, I said, I said, it's interesting you're not more like, I actually, I, 
I, I might have phrased it wrong because I was like, you. I feel like you would be into some JRPGs and stuff like that if you're really this into Paper Mario and like, and like Luigi and Mario Superstars and stuff like that. Like they're very turn-based abilities, stuff like that. No, because I'm not. I'm. I'm gonna say something. I don't fully mean it. I need you to give me some wiggle room here, but I don't really see the crossover between JRPGs and the Mario RPG and the Paper Marios. And the reason why is I feel like the Mario ones are so they're so watered down, but they're also so like Nintendo heavy in terms of like we're going to have style and we're going to have some charm in here that they feel like they have branched in two completely different directions that I don't easily see jumping from one to the other. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I with Super Mario RPG is probably the closest to a JRPG. Um, yeah. and then they branch off from there. But I, just in the sense of like a game where you have a party of characters and you are yeah. turn-based fighting yeah. bosses and going through areas, and like she, she, she's just there on menus, grabbing items, doing stuff. Like her run in Paper Mario, uh, and again, I'm stealing all of her thunder, but she'll never know about this. Um, she like, she's like, oh, my strategy, like I. I you never give Mario health. You only give him attack damage because there's so many uh, of these. I don't know what the system is, but like badge systems that give you damage boosts if your health is five. So Mario has yeah. five health the entire game, but she does like insane damage, massive damage against enemies and stuff. Yeah. So it's like, uh, I don't know. She's she's good at that that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, I can see stuff, that. So yeah, so she would so she would like JRPGs with like party buff boost heavy stuff like that. Yeah, yeah exactly so yeah anyway she'll be on at some point to talk about that uh and we're excited we're excited for that halucha's excited for that um anyways moving on it's news time ian why don't you talk about the news while i blow my nose yeah we've got a light news week this week uh let's talk about layoffs folks they keep happening we're still upset about them let's give you the latest numbers uh, Ubisoft Toronto had approximately 33 people laid off as they uh, continue their their layoff spree. It, it's kind of weird this year. It feels like previously companies would say surprise layoffs. And this year they're trying to soften it by saying, by the way, we're going to be doing layoffs the next three months. Uh, Ubisoft is one of those companies. And so they're continuing their layoffs of uh, 33 people impacted at, at Ubisoft Toronto. Uh, Microsoft is another one of those companies. They, uh, they've already had layoffs this year. They're continuing to lay people off. There are approximately 1,500 people that were impacted in June uh, and early July. Some of those are Xbox team members. Um, and then Tales of Kenzara Zhao Studios. I'm sorry. Tales of Kenzara Zhao, which is the game, that studio has been hit with layoffs. Guys, maybe, maybe work on your... Uh, eh, sorry <laughs> it's just uh the game didn't release that well didn't get a lot of positive buzz maybe it's the title guys but anyways unfortunately they've had to lay off some people uh unclear the number of people that have been impacted unfortunately that brings the 2024 total of layoffs in the games industry to 10,800 which as we talked about last time is already more than all of 2023 combined um wow we don't need to talk about this this sucks we can we, we, it's we we've analyzed it to death some of this makes sense a lot of it doesn't and it just continues to suck yeah but the shareholders um, ian uh, i think that's the part you're missing fuck em. <laughs> let's talk about game news <laughs> all right let me run through these we got a little bit of time tell me what you're interested in uh according to the ubisoft ceo they are working on multiple assassin's creed remakes uh star wars bounty hunter is coming to uh consoles it's a remaster. We don't need to go into that can of worms, but they're <laughs> bringing Star Wars Bounty Hunter back. Uh, Sega has confirmed that the new Crazy Taxi game is an open world multiplayer game. And Factorio Space Age, the first DLC, has a release date of October 21st. Any of these grabbing your attention, Will? Oh, I mean, we don't have to talk about it, but I'm very excited for Factorio Space Age. I, I am too, and we can promise now here live on stream. This will be the next episode, the next series, the next guys. It's early. The next season of the Sandbox. <gasps> we will be doing Factorio Space Age probably mid-November because depending, I I think we should do it 
after Extra Life. There's too much shit going on. Yeah, agreed. Before Extra Life. But yeah, we will definitely be playing this on stream because I've beaten Factorio before. Will has never beaten Factorio. And this is this is taking the end game of the original Factorio and bringing it a bit earlier, but then also adding going to space and five other planets and stuff. So very, very excited for this. Um, for me, can I ask a question? You played Star Wars Bounty Hunter? I have not played Star Wars Bounty Hunter. So it's just Kyle. I feel like Kyle's the one that talks positively about it. I'm excited. I've always wanted to play this game, but I never have. Same. I've always heard good things about it. I've heard it's fun and great. I think, I'm pretty sure it's on the uh, the GameCube uh, SD card I bought from Nintendo on my GameCube. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's on there. So I should check it out. But yeah, I've, I've never played it. Uh, and it seems like a fun game. I hope it's a better remaster than... I mean, you don't have to worry about multiplayer and netcode with Battlefront, so hopefully it's a little bit better than that one. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm curious to see what these reviews are, and, and I definitely want to check it out. Crazy Taxi, though. Uh, I, I was never a big Crazy Taxi fan. I have nothing against it. It feels like a great arcade game, and that's it. I don't understand playing it more than just a quarter or two at a time. But hearing that they are going to make it an open-world multiplayer game... <laughs> where you have basically a giant shared city that other people are doing taxi fares in and you're doing taxi fares in and there's a bunch of different weird mini games and stuff that you're doing and other people are doing. I'm interested in this now. What about you, Will? Yeah, I, I was trying to think about it. Like, I I didn't read any of this article, but to me that sounds like a... Um, a, like, uh, a, a, what's the extraction shooters one where it's just like a battle royale and everyone you know that like tetris 99 where like everyone's yes. doing taxi fares and it like every 10 seconds it eliminates the worst player sort of thing yeah like that's how i'm envisioning it i don't think that's necessarily what it is but just no the- this is more than that this this is like forza horizon right where where everybody's racing and doing their thing but then there's events that pop off so it's like that's oh we've got wild. an event starting over here do you, you want to join this race oh we got this jump contest do you want to join this jump contest like if they do this right and it's really like 30 people on a city map and it's just like midtown madness but 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 oh, everybody's running around crazy goodness. that and and like i i want them to add level up and rank up so it's like like give me something to grind on hell yeah i would love this <laughs> careful <laughs> careful careful uh yeah i'm excited for it sounds like fun yeah uh, that's it for the gaming news this week. Um, well, we've got a new section here called content call out. Was this your doing? What? Is this? Uh, yeah, we, we've replaced the, the is... wish list with content call out. Is that oh. right? I, what? No. This is a bad bit. <laughs> Because what I put this here. Oh. 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 Anyways, um, I wish list roundup. We're not retiring it. We're revamping it a bit. And um, one of my ideas is calling out content in the games industry and games space that we enjoy. And the reason why I'm doing this is I watched a YouTube video yesterday <gasps> wow. that surprised me. Um, Will, have you heard of this game called The Forever Winter? It was about all the stuff that's in the vaccine. Um, so, no, it's I haven't. Epstein's Island. Sorry. <laughs> um, so anyways, it's, it's from this content creator called Rilo, R-I-L-O-E. He made a video called The Anti-Shooter Game. This anti-shooter game is beautiful and horrifying. And I watched this. It's about a 15, 20 minute YouTube video. And essentially, um, Forever Winter is a, a extraction shooter that is coming out uh, sometime soon. They don't have a release date yet, but the studio invited this content creator out. It's not a sponsorship or anything, but they basically invited him out and they said, hey, we want to show off our game to you and get some ideas off of you and have you play in the play test. And Rilo got so excited about it that he made multiple videos. This is one of them. and. Um, it's it's really cool. Basically, the thing that really struck me about this game is that the developers are not trying to make a shooter, right? They're like, you're not the main character. You're in a world. It's like World War Three with like mechs and nukes and tanks and has been happening for generations. 
So you just have these like never ending conflicts and you have trench warfare and you have these like uh, like destroyed cities that people have lived in for decades, just scavenging, etc. And it's a looter shooter where you are going into the battlefield. The battlefield has multiple factions actively fighting and you're you're given tasks. To basically scavenge in the middle of a battlefield and survive. So so he he was giving all these crazy examples about how like, hey, you know, like uh, we needed to get this scrap and we saw it on the other side of this opening. But there was a tank in there and the tank kept circling around and we were hiding from the tank. And all of a sudden the tank started shooting at us. But then we realized it wasn't shooting at us. It was shooting over us because an enemy f- squad was coming into the area. So we scooted to the side and while they were distracted shooting each other, we went up behind them and looted it. And so it's like it, it, just watching this video and hearing him interview the devs and talk about how the devs really want to focus on like the non-combatant side of of warfare and how, uh, you know, war is hell, et cetera. It's uh, it looks really, really good. So it's it's a combination of a wish list. Go check out the Forever Winter, but also definitely go check out this video because it has done nothing against their marketing campaign for Forever Winter. But this this video has me very excited about this game now. So definitely go check it out. Does this, uh, I'm watching the video now. So are the people fighting the war or is that NPCs? Yeah, it's all okay. NPCs. Yeah. So, That's so wild. like, he, yeah. And he was, he was showing footage of just like you're walking around the map and you see like these giant battles taking place and you'll have objectives. And the objectives are like, scavenge this type of technology kill two of these unit like scavenge this other technology and so you're like trying to find the technology or you're waiting for somebody to kill that unit so you can scavenge off of it but then sometimes you know you're given a mission where you have to pick off one or two guys but you don't want to kill all of them because then you'll get too much attention and it it was really really cool one of the key things he talked about was how the game you're not the main character in the game in that you're not the main character in the war you're not the hero and he said it was they've done it really well. And it felt so weird because he would he would come up to these battles and he would see bad guys and he would immediately assume that they would see him turn to him, start shooting, walking towards him. And he was like, no, that only happens if you're spotted. And in some cases, they don't care you're there unless you're aggressive towards them. So you really are just kind of like this, like sideline spectator trying to survive in the middle of a battle zone. And the NPCs are they don't care about you unless you are aggressive towards them. And he was like, it was such a shock to play a game that actually does that because 99% of video games are not built like that. They're all built around aggro and sightline on you, etc. I really want, and I don't know if this is in there, but I would love like a, oh, your mission is to like, you can also sell ammunition and shit you pick up to the soldiers. Like, yeah. And be like, oh, they want to buy extra food rations from you or money. And stuff like yeah. that. Uh, and like, it's or probably, you can walk up and be like, hey, I want to pass through this no man's land. If I give you this, will you let me through? Like that sort of stuff. Yeah, That'd that could neat. be cool. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. This looks really neat. I'm going to add this and, and, and check out that, uh, that video as well. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for launching the new, uh, the new content call out. We've been talking about it for weeks, and I'm really excited yeah. that it's here. Folks, um, if you didn't know... Uh, it's the end of the end of the episode, so uh, I don't have any outro music. We're gonna pretend it's here because the Steam Deck. I tried to actually update it during this, and it said, "Hey, you need to close OBS." And I said, "I'm not gonna do that." So uh, that can happen. I think that was the thing. I think I skipped an update, and you know what happens when you skip an update? Uh, your computer hates you and doesn't work anymore. Um, folks, subpixelfilms.com is where you can go find all of our content. Local chat Thursdays, every Thursday, 9 p.m. Except for this one. It's a Friday at 8 a.m. Uh, happy 4th. I uh, hope everyone's 4th was great. Uh, we will be back uh, Tuesday. Or actually, we'll be back today at 5 p.m. Eastern with... Uh, maybe I'll tune in. Ian, I missed it yesterday because I was at the fair. But uh, uh, Ian's playing some Fallout New Vegas. I'm very excited for that. Uh, and then we'll be back on Monday. He'll be doing that again. And then Tuesday, I believe, some Fired Emblem. I got to message my boys, see what's up. Uh, we are we are dangerously close to the end of that game, and I'm very excited about it. Um, I think that's it. I'm gonna I'm gonna slowly wave, uh, and I'll see you all next week. Um, bye. Bye.